Thank you so much. That was so sweet. Hi, I'm Sarah. I am a grateful member of the Al Anon family groups, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Looking out at all of you is really remarkable. And um, I have felt so welcomed from the second I got off the plane, not just from Al Anons, but just from people from Minnesota. I don't know if we're that friendly in California, but um, it has been a real treat to be here. And I do want to thank Susan, who's been my lovely hostess. I have beautiful flowers in my room. Thank you for arranging them personally. That's so lovely of you. And, um, you know, Sarah and Kathy picked us up at Mall of America, and which was so fun. And um, it's just been wonderful. Denise and Sherry, and I, I mean, I could go on and on. Just the committee. And Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, thank you for inviting Alan on into your way of life, into this design for living. Um, and this conference in particular is huge. And the energy here, it, uh, last night I was just like, you know, I mean, you guys are my drug of choice. So I am really just on a high. I mean, it's incredible. So um, <laughs> I... It feels good for me to be with you, and um, I just want to thank you for that. Um, having said that, I did hesitate to saying yes. Um, it's really easy for me, in my experience, to talk about my life and some of the things that have happened to me when my um, current situation or my present life is going well. And it really isn't right now. And um, I'm not in a super great place, and so it's especially difficult for me to be here. However, um, I have an amazing God. And he's super efficient, and he uses anybody and everybody in every situation. Nothing goes wasted, and I believe that he wanted me here today. And I believe that he wanted you to be sitting here listening to me. So I am going to invite you to take on this attitude of expectancy, that we're here for a reason, and there's going to be something uh, that you walk away with. And maybe it's just putting aside your life and your issues and enjoying um, my chaos. Um, <laughs> You know, I love the saying, if you can't be a good example, be a loud warning. So um, I may be that loud warning for you. Uh, but I am here, and I am willing. I am so grateful for the program of Allen on Family Groups. Um, I'll throw out the stats so you don't have to do the math while I'm talking, but I came into Alateen at 14 years old. Um, Tomorrow, I'll be 36 years old, so I just celebrated 21 years in the program, and um, thank you. The big joke is I'm 21 now. Maybe I can pick up a drink. No. <laughs> I don't like drinking. I'm not a drinker, never have been. Um, I don't like the idea of being out of control. I don't want to need anything. In fact, I want to be needed. Um, that trumps anything that's entertaining or fun or whatever it is that you say that drinking does for you. It does not do it for me. And um, But as it was said earlier, uh, maybe last night, it, you know, if drinking did for me what it has done for some of you, then I might be with you. And um, I know there have been times that my story resembles more of an alcoholic woman than an Al-Anon woman. And um, I know there's some other sickos out there like me, so I'm not alone. But I, I'm not your typical doormat, people-pleasing Al-Anon. I'm a little bit I'm feisty, and I have a little bit of an ego and uh, an anger issue and vengeful, and um, I'm going to suck the life out of you, basically. Um, that's the kind of Al-Anon I am. My kind of love hurts. So um, bear with me. I, I don't want to represent all of Al-Anon family groups. Um, I'm just sharing my story and how Al-Anon has changed me for the better and um, made an ugly situation beautiful. And that's totally God's doing. So if anything, um, if you can walk away and say, you know, God, God is at alive and well and working here, um, I hope you get that out of my story. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank my 16-year-old daughter, who's here with me as my guest, Carissa. And if you get a chance, thank her too. Um, because she's lived with me this entire time and um, certainly didn't deserve the, the childhood she had. However, um, I am so lucky and so blessed and honored to be her mom. And I, I, I got to tell you, she wasn't impressed that I was speaking and certainly didn't really want to come to an Alcoholics Anonymous convention, if you know what I mean. Uh, she's very much a normie. Um, 
However, Mall of America is in Minnesota. <laughs> and uh, bribery works in adolescence. So uh, we took a red eye. We arrived at 5.30 a.m. yesterday, having very little sleep. We got into our hotel, thankfully, slept for a couple hours, woke up. Uh, you know, Dee spoke earlier, and he talked about not being a planner and living spontaneously. I'm quite the opposite. I come from chaos, and so I'm very anal and structured. I had called ahead. I got the map, the directory from all of America, the catalog. I got out all my coupons, all my promos. I knew what stores had sales. I mapped it out. We knew exactly where we were going. The difference is there. We I, I added leeway time because if you're like me and you make your plans, things go awry. And so I, I've learned in Al-Anon to soften up a little bit. I can still make my plans, but I always have a plan B and a plan C. And I also didn't say, this is what we're going to do when. It was like, this is what we'd like to do, and then we can kind of go with it. And it worked well. We had a great time. Um, that's the kind of Al-Anon I am. And I, I really want to thank you for being here, too, um, to support me. It means a whole lot. Anyways, um, I grew up. Uh, in a family that was affected by alcoholism. And today, most people in my family call it the disease of alcoholism by its name. Um, you don't have to drink to suffer from alcoholism, obviously. Um, but for a lot of years, nobody really called it by its name. We didn't know what was wrong with our family. Um, I knew something was wrong from a very young age, very wrong. And um, I felt compelled to do something about it. What, I didn't know, but just something. And whatever it was that my parents were doing, it was not enough. And uh, my, basically, to sum it up, my dad drank, my mom cried, and I screamed. And I was so angry all the time. Um, I'm the oldest of five, and I can remember when, um, I think it was the second to the youngest was born, I totally remember looking at my mom in this judgmental, arrogant way and thinking, I could be a better mother than her. And I just had this arrogance and this anger, and both my parents were weak. My dad couldn't really hold down a job. My mom couldn't get him to do anything. We never had food in the house. We never had money. We were moving all the time. All of us were born in different states. And it was just, and the house was a mess, and the, the yard was the, you know, the ugliest house on the block with the weeds up to here, and it was like unmanageability all the time. And I felt so angry that this was our life. And I really remember thinking, if I, only I was born in a different family, you know, I would be okay. Why did I have to be in this family? And it was all about them. If they would all get it together, I would be okay. And, um, you know, I was so resentful. I, my dad is, um, or has been, well, actually is again, but... Anyways, he's really involved in um, ministry. He's a preacher. And, and so I have some religious residue um, that I'll try to keep away from the podium. But, um, but on the other hand, if you're thinking that girl's charismatic, it's from my dad. And I'm grateful to that man for that. And I can see the good that he has given me. And I am no longer ashamed of the parts of me that resemble my father, which is totally a gift in Al-Anon. But anyway, this is what it looked like for me growing up. My dad always had people around him, people that were looking up to him, that thought he was wonderful. And I felt like the only one who knew the truth. Like, it was maddening. Like, I wanted to scream. Like, whoa, bitch. You know, what is going on? And people would, like, pat me on the head. I'm blonde hair, blue eyes, and I used to be this, well, I, I still am short, but not as petite. Um, little, you know, cute little girl, and they'd pat me on the head. What a cute little girl. And I felt like there was this <sighs> ugly black monster living inside of me. Like, I did not feel like this cute little girl. I just felt so just nervous and angry and old, really old. And um, not physically old, but like just emotionally. Like inside, I felt, I've always felt old and um, tired old. And just like I, I, just, I don't even know how to explain it. But it was basically one of the reasons why I think when I came into my very first meeting at 14 years old, I glommed onto it. And I'm one of those people that have been coming to meetings ever since. I, It's like a spaceship landed and all my people got off. I mean, I was like... <laughs> I totally clicked when I came to my first meeting. And I remember, there's two people that were at my first meeting who I still see today. It's really neat. But um, this guy in the room at the Alateen meeting, he, 
Now, mind you, i got to go back. I'm a little bit of a, a goody two-shoes. You probably picked up on that because I don't drink. Um, and I'm a preacher's kid. And so I get straight A's. And um, I come into this meeting, and this guy, like, leans back in his chair, and he has a big leather jacket on. He's missing his front tooth, a mohawk up to here. This was in 87. So a mohawk up to here that was bleached white, earrings all the way up. And he leans back, and he said hi to me. And everything inside of me just was like, ah, because he looked as bad as I felt, and instantly I was attracted. I was just like, ah. I mean, he was so hot. And... um, I knew that, you know, you guys had what I wanted and that whole thing. I just, it clicked. So I started going to Alateen, and I loved my meeting. Um, I was 14, turned 15, and shortly after being in Alateen, I learned you can't make an alcoholic stop drinking. It's like trying to tell somebody with pneumonia to stop coughing. And I had really, like, glommed on to the fact that my dad, the, the constant in his life was the drinking. And although... They say you only know alcoholism by the alcoholic you know. Um, my father was a periodic, so there, he could go per- great lengths of time without drinking. So it was scary for me, um, you know, not really being able to pick up on it. And, and so sometimes I thought it was depression, which I know he also suffered from. And sometimes I thought he was just an idiot because he couldn't keep a job. And so I, I didn't really know the problem. And then once I found out about the alcoholic word. I I thought it was one more name to call him. You know, it was that kind of a thing. But um, when I learned you can't, like, what's the point of going to meetings? Why are we here? You can't make him stop drinking? What? And um, my solution to that was leave home. And, you know, I didn't run it by a sponsor or talk to anybody about it. I just decided I've got to go. And so at 15 years old, I left home. And with that comes a lot of um, connotations and judgment. And, you know, for my own self-worth or whatever, I have to tell you, I was not a bad kid. I really was a good kid. But I I could no longer live in active alcoholism. And I just did the best I could with what I got. And I had to leave home. And my younger brothers and sisters felt like I abandoned them. And it was a very painful time. And still to this day, there there's some um, hurt with my younger sisters and I over that. And I just, you know, I'm making a living amends and I'm, I'm grateful for this program because I don't have a problem. If I have to make amends to my family to the day I die, I will, but, um, which is fine because it's a better way to live. Um, but anyway, my sisters really felt like I had abandoned them and deserted them and my mom too. And, uh, right after I left the house, it, it was really just to prove a point, you know, we want, we want cut off your nose to spite your face. I just wanted to show my dad that I was stronger than him because he would always say he was going to leave and I'm leaving you all and make this dramatic scene and run out in the street. And, and then he'd come back an hour later, you know, and it was so, so I left to show that I could. And after two months, my dad had lost everything and went into a big slump of depression. And my mom ended up being moved into a shelter with the two younger ones. And my brother went and lived in this family. My sister went and lived in this family. And there was no home to go back to. And so it was kind of like my bluff had been called, and now I'm here. And so luckily for me, I I, I had these, you know, brains, whatever. Um, I got good grades. And I really thought that God, like... Um, I thought he worked like this. I thought, you know, he gives and takes. So I thought, okay, I had this messed up home, but then he gave me these brains so I could go to school and I could be somebody and I could get out and I could go ahead and never look back. And I would be successful and be somebody. And um, so I put everything into school and I ended up getting a scholarship and I went to a private high school and I cleaned the men and the boys and girls bathroom in order to stay at that school. And I really was a good kid. Um, and then I went to Alateen. And, and Alateen was like my outlet. It was where I could be my age and be with other people my age and feel like I wasn't the weirdest kid in the room. And I would go to campouts and um, I had commitments and I went to conferences. And it, it was very, um, I, I felt like I belonged somewhere. Like it wasn't all in vain. Like I'm not the only one. And it really helped me. The problem was... I didn't really work the steps. Um, I, I came for the fellowship. And, um, you know, there, there's magic in working the 12 steps. But um, I'd get a sponsor, and I'd work steps one, two, three, and then I'd get a new sponsor. And um, that was a game I kind of played. And um, anyways, I found out that um, I'm a really good girlfriend. And um, 
a really good girlfriend to people with problems. And um, so I always had a boyfriend, and, I, and he, I'm the kind of person that I, I go out with people that make me look good. So if you're standing next to me and your life is falling apart, I look a whole lot better. And, it, you know, it, it's, all, it's not really about saving you. It's about me looking good. And um, so anyway, I, I pick winners. <laughs> and um, <laughs> usually newcomers sober in AA. And, um, yeah, I was one of those. Anyways, watch out for the Alateens. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, um, I found myself pregnant. And um, I was, you know, 18, 19 years old, and I hit a bottom. You don't have to be pregnant to hit a bottom, but um, just I did. I, it, it, for me, that was huge. That was, like, crazy. And um, I couldn't believe it. I mean, certainly I couldn't blame it on my dad. I couldn't blame it on my mom. I was like, wow, I'm looking at the problem. And um, I knew my life was insane, and I had... Um, just decided I would just move to the East Coast, and I'm in California. I was going to move to Maryland, where I knew I had some distant relative, and have a baby, put it up for adoption, come back, and act like nothing ever happened. And the Alateens said, no, you're not doing that. You're not running. That's the thing that you resent most about your dad, because we would, you know, up and move to another city whenever things got weird. And um, you're going to stay right here. And we don't care what you do with the baby, but you're staying here. And you're going to do this with us. You're not going to do anything alone. And that Alateen group really... Um, it, they carried me through my pregnancy, and it, uh, a month before Carissa was born, I decided to keep her, and I, um, I'm still overwhelmed by that decision because I feel grossly inadequate, and I just knew that I was going to need a lot of help raising this child because from where I came from, I certainly didn't want to repeat or continue the legacy of alcoholism in my girl's life, and it was already off to a bad start. So... I was very vulnerable during that time and really receptive to the program because I'd been around the program for so many years. And there is a difference between being around the program and really being in the program or having the program in you. And um, I was just desperate. And, you know, I fell into a very structured, strong, black belt Al-Anon group. And... Um, the structure suited me. It was like the stability I always craved. And I fell right in. Um, I, you know, th there's a saying that, you know, for every crazy person out there who's trying to control someone else, there's someone else just as crazy who wants to be controlled. And that was at a time in my life when I was in transition. And those are the kind of people that are attracted to control or structured groups is, you know, I was in this place where I, I, I felt very distant from God. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had this little girl and certainly, uh, I, no father around, and I was like, oh my gosh, and so I was willing to do whatever I was told, and um, and I loved my life at that time. Um, I got very active in Al-Anon. I started going to meetings every single day, um, because it feels so good to be in a meeting, and you're surrounded by people that are working a program. I mean, it's much harder to take it outside and do life out here, you know, and I, while I recognize that this is all a good time and we're having a great weekend here. I know there's some of you right now that are hurting. And, you know, life is just really hard. It doesn't necessarily get easier because we're in recovery. Um, however, we share it together. We share the burden together. Anyways, um, I, I met a man in Alcoholics Anonymous who was two years sober. Woo! And um, I'd never been with someone with that length of sobriety. And... Um, he asked me for my phone number at a convention planning meeting, and um, he wrote my number in his big book. If that's not a sign, I knew it was destiny. And, I mean, this guy was not just sober. He was shining sober. He had commitments. He sponsored others. He went to prison on panels. Um, evidently, that's the key thing this weekend. So, anyway, um, if you're single, go on a prison panel. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway... Um, I was just, I, I thought I had arrived. You know, we have a book in Al-Anon called The Dilemma of the Alcoholic Marriage. And for years, I didn't understand why they called it a dilemma. Um, you know, that, which is a sign of my insanity because I willingly married an alcoholic. Willingly. Um, crazy. Anyways. Um, he and I fell in love on the campus of AA, and we began to do this life together, and it was bliss. Um, and he adopted Carissa. In fact, he is the only father she's ever known, and um, 
we had the little family in recovery. And um, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was starting to buy into this fallacy or this belief system that if I was a good enough Al-Anon, then alcoholism could not get me again, nor could it get my daughter. And I really believe that. I think that was the motivation behind everything. My recovery was fear-based. I was afraid of alcoholism. And so I was working a program out of fear rather than working a program out of love or gratitude for this beautiful way of life. Um, anyways, what happened was, I know you won't be surprised, but I was. He's an alcoholic, and what do alcoholics do? They drink. Um, however, each time there's a sober period, we think the problem has gone away. That's in our literature. He had a sober period of nearly nine years, and um, he was a member in good standing, and um, it was very abrupt, and, to say the least. I felt like I came home and a bomb had exploded in my house. Um, and he didn't just like go out and have a beer. I mean, he full on went out and just dove into the disease of alcoholism. And our home group and the people around us, his sponsor, the people he sponsored, everybody was like shocked. Like what the hell just happened? Um, this is alcoholism we're dealing with. And it is abnormal for an alcoholic to be sober. Um, but you know, it, I just, I guess I felt immune. And, um, a couple weeks before the truth came out or whatever, um, I had smelled alcohol. I thought I smelled alcohol in our bed on him or something. And this just shows you my denial. But um, I, I hadn't smelled alcohol in so many years because I was one of those al who just cut everybody out of my life who wasn't in recovery because I stick with the winners. Um, your, your world gets really small. But anyway, um, I smelled alcohol and I thought, well, it can't be Jeb. It must be the dog. Now... My golden retriever does not drink uh, and never has had a drinking problem as far as I know. And But I accepted that as rational and went to sleep that night. And, you know, I, I, there have been times in my life when I've looked back and said, what was wrong with me? Why didn't I see the signs? You know, and I never trust my gut. That's like a big, a big Allen on symptom. You know, I, I always think someone else knows better. Someone else has the answers. Every, everything's outside of me, and I, I never trust that still small voice or that gut inside of me that God created and put there for a reason, and it's just as credible as anyone else's, but, um, you know, I don't beat myself up over that. I, For whatever reason, I needed to sleep that night, and more shall be revealed means that things are uncovered when they're supposed to be uncovered, and I just wasn't ready. Um, but the way it happened was I came home to a note, which was kind of yucky. And um, and our whole life blew up. And it was at that time when um, our home group got really weird. And it was very much like alienate him, get him out. It's like nobody wants to catch it. And um, my daughter came home one night. And she, she was seven years old. And she said, Mommy, Mommy, they're talking about Daddy at the meetings like he's a monster. He's not my a monster. He's my Daddy. And I got down, and I looked at her, and I said, Oh, honey, you're right. He's not a monster. Your Daddy loves you so much, and no one can take that from you. And then she goes, Well, why won't you let me see him? And I said, Because he's drinking! And I realized when I said that, I might as well have called her Dad a monster. And it was like, Oh, my gosh, is it okay to love an alcoholic? Or is it only okay to love a sober alcoholic? And the whole program changed for me in, in, in a heartbeat. It's like everything started to just change and shift. And I started hearing things in meetings different. I'd pick up the literature, and it meant more to me. I got it. Um, you know, there's a whole chapter on the disease of alcoholism, more about alcoholism in the big book that spoke to me. And I was like, I, I, I read things that never meant anything to me before. And all of a sudden, I was realizing there's not this on and off switch for love. You don't get to say, oh, you're drinking now? Click. I don't love you anymore. I, I don't know where that switch is. I didn't just stop loving him because he started drinking. And and there were people around me in recovery who wanted me to do just that. And I couldn't. Um, and so I, it was it was maddening time for me. It really was. And what ended up happening is I ended up changing sponsors, which was very painful. And I uh, started going to more meetings, which is always a good thing to do um, when you're in pain. Um, you know, maybe not double the meetings you're going to, because I was going like every day, but for me, it was 
go to different meetings, you know, step out and, and take someone with me, obviously. And the sponsor that I got at that time was just a godsend to me. She, um, number one, she made me laugh. Even when I was feeling like I was going to die, like the worst was happening, she made me laugh. And she saw the humor in our situation, and it was a blessing. I remember when I introduced her to my husband. She had never met him before. And uh, we weren't living together. I have to clarify. I had made a pact with myself as like six, year, six or seven or eight years old, a little girl, that I would never live with someone drinking. I would never have alcohol in my home. And I don't know where I got that, but I had that from a young age. So when he went back out to drinking, I knew we couldn't live together. However, he stayed over like every night. It's like his stuff didn't live with us. So I really just didn't live with the the stuff of an alcoholic who was drinking. So whatever. Um, you know, like his clothes and everything was elsewhere. But anyway, um, you know, it's like the, we tweak our own convictions. You know, it gets weird. I mean, we get sick, too. I'm not even drinking. And I, all of a sudden, my principles and my convictions are getting tweaked and compromised just because i got to live with myself. And I don't know how to love an alcoholic and do so in recovery. And so, anyway, um, I introduced her to him to my sponsor for the first time. And I remember he was loaded. <sighs> and... Um, I was like, oh gosh, I want, like I wanted him to make a good impression or something, you know? And, uh, she knew that he'd gone back out and he'd been in AA for a while. Anyways, he starts rattling off all these people he's gonna kill, which is always impressive when you meet someone. And, uh, I was so, like, inside I was like cringing. And my sponsor said, you know, can I add a couple names to that list while you're at it? I mean, she made this joke. It was, so funny and we all laughed and I felt like you know like you guys have taught me how to love an alcoholic you know hate the disease love the person I remember um, during that crazy time when he was back using um, I would show up at parties you know maybe I'll be one of those wives of a drinker like there, there are some courageous women in our meetings today that live with drinking and have never seen a sober breath on their loved ones so you know if they can do it maybe I can and so I'd go to these parties and I, I remember one time I had a commitment at a um, assembly and I came home from the assembly or maybe it was anyway um, and I went to this birthday party where he had taken our daughter and I could see all the adults were drinking with kids at the party I, 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 I know you guys aren't surprised, but I was surprised. <laughs> like, I couldn't believe that's what they do at a child's party. And so I grabbed my daughter, and I'm like, honey, there's drinking here. Are you okay? <laughs> and she's like, mom, you're the one who has a problem with drinking. And she's like eight years old. And so, you know, things like that were happening. I just, I was weird. And um, I was the only sober one. At one party I went to, um, a kid fell in the pool, like could have died. You know, and I jumped in with my clothes on, saved the little boy's life, pulled him out of the pool, and a big fight broke out. I'm standing there dripping wet. My husband's laughing. The little kid ran off to the jumper, and I'm like, I just saved this kid's life, and I'm not a hero. I'm like totally humiliated, and it was like things like that just, I felt like I was on a totally different plane. Like I just, we were not connecting. I don't fit in the drinking world, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Anyways, um, and he would try to meet me in my world. He'd come to conventions loaded, and um, I'd be, like, trying to hide it from people. Like, alcoholics don't know when another one is... Anyway. And, you know, people treated him no different. I mean, I was freaking out at this Orange County convention that we have because I'm thinking, I wonder if people remember he was the spiritual speaker last year. And, you know, I, I'm sure they did. And they still hugged him, welcomed him, got him a cup of coffee. I mean, they treated him like they treated anyone else. And I was humbled by that. I, I was blown away by the love that I saw from one alcoholic to another. And I don't know if it did anything for him, but it really did a lot for my recovery. It showed me, you know, that it, it, it's not of my power to love an alcoholic. It's got to be God through me. And um, if I'm walking in the line of recovery, it's just there's there, the resentment and all that other stuff. There's no room. You know, I, it's a small path. So anyway, um, basically we, we were not connecting. And he... Um, he was uh, fighting the courts at that time. He had committed a, a crime, and but they had unjustly charged him. And um, 
And so the big battle was, do I go to court with him or not? I don't approve of what he's being charged for. I, you know, I don't really approve of him even fighting this. But do I show up for court or not? And my sponsor said something magical to me. She said, it's not so much important to me that you do what I think you should do, but it's important that you keep telling me what you're doing. And the reason for that is it's not the secrets that kill us. It's the keeping of the secrets. Who cares what the secret is? Who ca you know, we, we get so bogged down with how ugly or I don't want to tell people that, you know, I've been coming to meetings for so long and this is what I'm dealing with. Oh, my gosh, just get it off your chest because the keeping of the secrets is what, you know, kills me. And um, that freed me up. And so there were some days when I totally did exactly the opposite of what my sponsor thought I should do. And I was like, oh, am I going to fall off the Allen on cliff? You know, I'm not obeying my sponsor. Um, but what she told me is, you're going you're gonna to take responsibility for your own life in doing this. And also, you're going to exercise that gut muscle, that trusting your gut. And sometimes it'll work better than other times. And you're going to make some mistakes, and you're going to fall on your face, and I'm going to love you no matter what. And that was like magical. She's going to love me no matter what. She's going to walk with me through this mess. And um, so some days I went to court and other days I didn't. It was like, okay, am I not going just because I'm trying to get him to hit a bottom? You know, there's a piece of literature called detachment that we have, which I love. And it talks about we don't create a crisis and we don't prevent a crisis if it's a natural course of events. And so it, to me, it's all about motives. Am I trying to create a crisis to get the alcoholic sober again? And if so, why? What, what am I missing in my own recovery? So anyway... Um, he finally decided to just go to jail, and I was so happy. I, I got a babysitter. I made a big dinner. He was turning himself in. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> um, and uh, you can see how, how, how annoying I am. Anyways, um, say a prayer for him tonight. No, anyway. So after dinner, I was cleaning the dishes. I came out, and I'm like, time to go to jail. And he's like, mm-mm. And I'm like, what? We agreed. We talked about this. This is the day that you're going to turn yourself in. And he's like, mm-mm. I'm like, what? And so, like, I stepped out of the room or something. He left. He left the house completely. I didn't know where he was. I'm crazy, lunatic, looking through our apartment complex. I finally found him behind 7-Eleven convenience store drinking a bottle of wine. And I'm like, are you nuts? You can't show up to jail drunk. And he's like, I can't show up to jail not drunk. You know, and I'm like... I mean, we just did not understand each other. That whole, like, he sees it as medicine, I see it as poison. We're not connecting. Anyways, I got him in the van. We showed up. The whole long goodbye, dramatic, and then it had already closed. So I have to take him home. The next morning I had a commitment from, like, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at our uh, World Service. I'm the district rep of Al-Anon. <laughs> and... Um, so I had one of the girls I sponsor with me, and we've got him in the car, and we drop him off at jail, we say the big old long goodbye, we go off to the meeting, and this girl that I sponsor looks at, poor thing, she looks over at me, and she goes, I wonder if any other al dropped their husbands off at jail today. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> So I showed up, and I did my commitment. I get a call about lunchtime, and I'm like, you're not in jail, are you? And he's like, no. And I'm like, I'm not leaving my commitment. I am working an Al-Anon program, and I am not coming to pick you up until 4. So, gosh. So I picked him up at 4, took him home. Sunday, I don't know, I think he had, wanted to go to church. You know, that's always a good one. Let's go to church instead of jail. Oh. Oh, okay. So, if you don't show up when you say you're going to show up, they come and get you. And um, that was not a good experience. And I'm sure it's not one of Carissa's favorite memories. But, um, you know, they did come to our house with guns drawn. And it was a scary scene. And I remember thinking, um, you know, my little girl's on the couch watching her dad face down with, you know, guns drawn. And and I remember thinking, um, maybe this will do it. You know, like maybe, maybe this will shock me out of loving him. Maybe this will be so incomp incomprehensible um, demor demoralization for me that I will be able to break free from this obsession with this man. I'm, maybe this will do it. I didn't do it. 
Um, you can't shock yourself out of loving someone. But anyway, um, to the best of my ability, I just continued to work a program. He finally got out, and um, he uh, d made a decision to get sober. Now, I thought he was sober in jail. I still don't quite understand this, but he was not sober in jail. And I don't know how they get that stuff in there. That is just baffling to me. Don't they have guards at the door? It's just, I don't know. Anyway, I, I do want to report to you that when I visited him in jail, I brought Alan on literature and shared it with everyone else in line. So I was carrying the message. You know, I'm very efficient too. I've got to do two things at once. But anyway, he did get out of jail, and that was kind of when things blew up. And he, um, you know, he had made a decision to get back into AA, and he also made a decision to go back to school. What is that about? I don't know. I guess a lot of newcomers want to go to school. It's like he quit smoking, quit drinking, quit using drugs, go to school. And I'm like, what about working? <laughs> that would help me. Um, anyway, so he would leave at like 6 in the morning and be home at midnight, and that's just not good for a marriage, five days a week. And, and then on the weekends, he's, you know, busy with his AA guys. And doing what he's supposed to do to stay sober. Unfortunately, I thought that because he had been sober for nine years, his going out for a couple years, and when he came back, I thought we'd go back, right back to where we were in recovery. And he was not the same person after going out. He was um, dark and sullen, unresponsive. Um, I, I, just, I remember talking to him and feeling like he was a vapor, like I was talking, like I, he, I, he was not present. And, um, you know, and I, I was looking forward to a break. I would have liked a year off. You know, I felt like you'd been in jail. You know, now it's time for you to step up. I'd like to, you know, let down my walls and relax a little bit. And um, it, that's just not what happened. He was more broken sober than he was messed up using and drinking. And that was really hard on me. And um, I remember that I think the clincher was he looked over once and he said, um, you know, I lost a lot when I went out. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, and I think part of what I lost was my love for you. And it was like, Ugh. I mean, what? After all I've done for you, everywhere I've been, and what the, pff, do you know what I look like out there? I mean, you're leaving me? I know, it's shocking. But <laughs> I'm still shocked. <laughs> anyway, um, that was a really dark time. But um, we ended up getting divorced, and um, I remember someone told me, if you're meant to be together, nothing in the world will keep you apart. And if you're not meant to be together, nothing in the world will keep you together. And it was like somehow there was a level of acceptance. It was okay. It was like, okay, this just is what it is. And so I'd show up at my meetings anyway, you know, and I, you know, here's the next chapter of the story. And the saga continues. And um, I remember he... Um, he got really active in AA again, as they do, and, um, you know, he's like the bachelor AA guy, and he's, you know, nice-looking guy, and girls like him, and, ugh. And um, anyway, he, you know, he wasn't really working, and um, so he was available, is what I'm trying to say. I was working. I had Alan on commitments. I'm busy, busy, busy. And I'm so busy because I don't want to feel. And so I've got commitment after commitment. And I, plus, I'm working a full-time job and raising this little girl. And I'm just crazy. I'm always late everywhere. I show up. And anyway, my daughter started playing soccer. And he was like soccer dad. You know, he was at every practice, every game. All the soccer people loved him. They got him a jersey with his name on it because they love him so much. And then here I am. Ah! You know, and then and I know they were judging me. You know, like you can tell by the way someone looks at you? I sense it when you're judging me. There's some of you judging me right now. I feel it. And I would go to, go to my phone in the car and just be crying and anger and just so mad. What is it about the alcoholic that makes everybody love them? And um, my sponsor said to me, what is it about you that wants to take away your daughter's hero? And I was like, oh, ouch. And she's like, how important is it for your daughter to have a dad in her life? Now, I mean, that's like my trigger. I mean, more than I wanted a sober husband, I wanted my daughter to have a sober daddy. More than anything in the whole world. And it's probably my biggest motivation 
for a lot of this stuff was that I just wanted my daughter to have a dad. And, um, and so I'd suck it up and do the right thing. And I talked to him with respect and I treated him with kindness and courtesy. And, um, I didn't badmouth him to the other lame soccer people. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I let them believe the lie. And, um, and that actually paid off. You know, it really, it really did. Believe it or not, that whole thing about you act yourself into right thinking and feeling and all of that is so true because I started to actually feel that respect towards him, feel that gratitude that he wanted to be so involved in our daughter's life. Um, you feel, you, I really started to feel that way and we got along really good and we would talk about it and laugh about it and be like, oh yeah, you know, some marriages just don't make it, you know, whatever. And um, then one time he asked my daughter if he could join us at church and she was like, yes, daddy. And um, I was like, you said what? And so um, she's like, why not, mom? And I'm like, oh, okay. And so we go to church together. And what happens is they dismiss the kids after a certain period. So she gets up from between us. And then it's just us. And then it's like awkward. So you move over so other people can. So then we're sitting together at church. And, I, you know, it's just like, ooh. Anyways, we started dating again, got married. Um, <laughs> I just cut to the chase. Get it over with. Um, so, I mean, in my hometown, people just die laughing whenever I talk because it's like, oh, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I love an alcoholic and he's no longer sober. And then I come up, you know, like a week later, I'm being facetious, but, you know, come back, oh, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, you know, I love an alcoholic. He's sober again, but doesn't love me. And then I come back a week later, oh, I'm embarrassed to say I love an alcoholic and, and he's divorcing me. And then I come back a week later, oh, I'm embarrassed to say I'm dating an alcoholic and same one. And, uh... <laughs> You know, and they're just like, get over it. You love an alcoholic. Get over it. You know, you're going to, you're going to feel bad no matter what. So just stop feeling bad. <laughs> Doesn't matter what's going on. Just let, just cut that part out. You know, I always feel less than. I always feel never enough. I always feel judged. You know, just cut that part out and just come and report your stuff. Just report your stuff, you know, and work the steps. Oh my God. If I wasn't working the steps, it, yeah, it would be nutty. Um, <laughs> can you imagine? I have to say that. This whole time, I'm working the steps. Can you believe that? And I'm this nuts. Crazy. I'm telling you, it would be way worse if I wasn't in recovery. So anyways, you guys take the edge off. You really do. Um, so we got married again, and I was sure, you know, this was it. That was the point of it all, to be restored. Now I have this happy ending to the story, you know, this life that I've always wanted. And um, I, I got pregnant on our honeymoon. Um, and I was like, oh, my goodness, my daughter's like 12, 13 years old. And I'd always wanted to have another baby. And I always wanted to do it the right way, you know, like the way God intended with the marriage first and then a baby. Um, there's a reason for that, by the way, in case some of you are wondering. It really helps to have two people. Such a difference. But anyway... Um, I had a miscarriage at four months, four and a half months, I think. And it, you talked about it. It was awful. However, it was very bonding for our family at that time. And it, it was like kind of like the cement that brought our family back. And it also was a time that I realized um, pretty powerfully that just as good things don't happen to me because I'm good, bad things don't happen to me because I'm bad. Life just is what it is, and how I react to it is up to me. But there's no judgment attached to what's happening in my life. God is not out there going, ooh, I'm going to have this happen and this happen and this happen right in a row. See how she handles that. I mean, that's just not who God is today to me. I, I don't think he ever was, but that's how I saw it. My perception was so distorted. Um, I think life just happens, and, you know, whether I choose to do it you know, an easier way with God's help, or if I continue to try to fight life on my own terms with my own resources, which are very limited, um, you know, it's up to me. So anyways, that was a, a difficult time, but I, I, I really saw that, it, and it helped me, is what I'm trying to say, because when my, I, I did get pregnant again, and I had a little boy who's now two and a half, um, so I have a toddler and a teenager. Life is very unmanageable. Yeah, crazy. And um but I have a boy and a girl and I'm I'm I love my son. I really do. And his name is Luke, which means healer. 
and it seemed appropriate. Um, and anyway, so Luke was six months old when my husband left again. And um, I'm not really sure why things happen the way they do, like I said, but they just do. Things just happen. And at that time, I didn't know what, what I didn't know that the dark shadow had returned to my home. I think I was so happy living this blissful, restored life. And I, I keep falling into that thinking, that weird thinking. I, I, I don't know if it's I don't think it's you guys. I think it's me. I think I get into that thinking that if I'm a good enough Al-Anon, my life will be good. And life is just hard. And um, the, the bottom line is, is that I have, I have a good life and I'm a happy life and I'm joyful because of the God within me, not because of my circumstances. If my happiness was dependent on my circumstances, I would be screwed. I really would be. And um, and also, you know, he is not my problem. Um if he was my problem, that would mean he was my solution, and that just can't be. So, you know, he's got a, a story to tell, and I'm not going to tell it to you this weekend, but um, he had nearly, uh, I guess, six years sober. He's still sober, um, but he has some outside issues. And, you know, alcoholism is insidious, and Alcoholics Anonymous and the al family groups is miraculous, but there are some outside issues that require outside help, and I'm glad he's getting help. However, um, it wasn't in time to save our family. So here we are. We're separated and parenting, again, um, living in two different places. And it's certainly not what I planned. Um, I'm sure it's not what, you know, Carissa planned. This isn't the life she wanted either. Uh, but we're making the most of it. And um, we... The dust has settled. The fighting is over. The tension is gone. I'm I'm not screaming at God, why, why, why anymore. Um, I will share with you that when it first started to happen again, I was I felt like not again. You know why me and all of that, and um and I didn't share a lot in my meetings, and uh, I cut back on some Al-Anon commitments partly because being a single mom of a teenager and toddler is exhausting, and my sponsor said that my kids are my number one Al-Anon commitment. And that uh, everything that I've learned and all the commitments I have come to this. What kind of mom am I? And um, so I cut way back, and my circle of support was really small. And my sponsor would say things like, this is just a season of your life. And um, you know what? So what if you're not popular in Al-Anon? So what if you don't get to go to every single thing and, you know, and everybody doesn't know every detail of your life? You're maintaining the dignity and stability of your home. And, you know, there's just something to be said. You know, I could, what I say to you one-on-one, -on -one, what I share in a meeting, what I share from this podium, um, if it damages another person, I can't really call that recovery. In the name of recovery, I cannot hurt another person. And so um, I got really selective with who I talked to about the details of my life. And um, the, the most amazing thing that happened from all of this is that um, I did not fall apart the way I did when he drank at nine years. And, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, a woman, and I like to change it to an Al-Anon, is like a tea bag. You only know how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And I love that because my recovery and all the work that I've done recently um, when we were separated and divorced really showed this last time. Like there was a calmness about me. And that's not to say that I haven't had outbursts. And, you know, I'm a very passionate person and also very emotional. You can ask my daughter. And... Um, and and I love to cry in the shower. And there have been times when she's banging on the door, I can hear you crying! <laughs> because, well, more like wailing. But, um, you know, I've learned that there's a time and a place that is appropriate to grieve. And there's a really neat book that just came out in Al-Anon called Transforming Our Losses. Not to give a little Al-Anon commercial, but I love that book. And there's a section in there where it talks about... Um, grieving the childhood that you didn't get to give your kids. And it just tore me up to read that, but it really gave me an, an avenue. You know, every time your heart breaks, it breaks open. I heard somebody speak, share that, and I love that. But it's like it's given me this way to forgive myself um, for some of the choices that I've made that I'm not really proud of. And I remember um, Carissa looked at me once. We were having breakfast, and and she said, Knowing what you know now, would you have married dad again? And it's like, oh, how do you answer that? You know, because on the one hand, I'm really grateful for my son. 
And he's really neat. And he, I know he wouldn't be here had I not gotten married again. On the other hand, the truth is, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't. But I didn't know what I knew now. You know, that's just not the way life is. You don't get reruns. You don't get to go fast forward, delete. There is a great movie called Click. <laughs> and I love, oh, I wish I had that. But anyway, um, you know, there's no rewind on my life. So, you know, I can take what I know now and use it for today. And um, what I've got to do is um, affirm her and, you know, share with her that while this may be the life she had growing up, it doesn't have to be her life from this point forward. She's going to make choices in her life. And, you know, God's got an amazing plan for her. It's evident um, just in just in knowing her. And um, and she doesn't have to live this way. You know, she doesn't. And the good news is, is that I, I just couldn't look her in the eye and say, this is what a marriage looks like, you know. So there's a part of me that's like, it's okay. It's just okay. Um, it is what it is. And we are still a family. Um, and that was really huge for me to be able to say. We are still a family. And, uh, you know, the family might not look the way it looks in some books or whatever, or the way society wants it to look, but we're still a family. And um, we're making the most of it. And, you know, I, I uh, every time my life has taken a sharp turn and something's happened, whether it be my husband drinking or, you know, me changing home groups or sponsors or, you know, him going to jail or leaving again or whatever, um, what it has done is it's given me a chance to assess why do I keep coming back? What really does it mean for me to be in recovery? What does it look like for Sarah to be an Al-Anon member? And, um, you know, I'm not here to get someone sober, to keep them sober, to change them, to force them to love me, you know, all of that. There, That's just not my motive. I just, I really totally subscribe to this way of life. Um, I just think it's a better way to live. And, you know, as I started to come out of the closet and tell people that, you know, my family was not actually restored and my husband wasn't even living with us anymore, like I, we went months without even telling people, um, partly because it was painful, but partly because I, I, I wanted to retain some dignity for my kids. And um, anyway, I was amazed once again at the reception. And people have been so loving to me and so warm and so, um, I did have somebody say to me, uh, I bet you feel dumb marrying him again, but um, <laughs> that was one person, they're really sick and I pray for them. No. <laughs> for the most part, people have been, you know, I have heard things like it's never wrong to love someone and you gave it your best shot and, you know, you, you, you you put yourself out there and, you know, that's, the, that's what matters. It took, it took courage and all of that good stuff. And my sponsor today talks about being gentle and how Al-Anon is a gentle way of life. It's a, a, a gentle uh, application of these principles. I'm not trying to force a solution. I'm not out there fighting my way through life. I'm out there saying, okay, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I've experienced. Um, these are the mistakes I've made. Um, these are my hopes and dreams. What can I do with it? Um, I, I do want to share one other thing, and that is when, during the time when my husband was drinking, my sponsor said something to me that just helped me so much. She said, I want you to make a list of all the good things that have happened because of his drinking. And I was really like, what? Like, that just didn't even sound right to me. But I made that list. And, you know, since then, I have made it a practice, not just to make gratitude lists, but to think about, okay, God, where are you in this ugly mess? And I am consciously seeking God's beauty in the mess. And it's, it, I tell you, it's a remarkable way to live. It does, it takes the sting out of my, the pain of my life. And I really do see God working. Um, one of the things that got to happen for me is I was able to go back to school and last year I graduated with a degree in business. And, um, thank you. And I'm not, you know, college, college is not for everyone, but I knew in my gut it was for me. And I could never go back to school. And I made a commitment to do that. And before I graduated, my husband had left. And I stayed in school. And I'm so grateful that I stuck it out, that I didn't allow the alcoholic to interrupt my dreams and my life goals. And I was able to graduate. And I, I'm so, it's like a, uh, an attest to the program. I am so grateful for the people in my meetings who stuck with me, who came over and babysat so I could go to class because being a single mom is just not easy or brought a meeting to my house. That was awesome too. Anyways, um, 
you know, that was huge for me. There's other things that have happened, other gifts. And the main thing that I wanted to share, too, is that there's people in my life that would not be in my life if I didn't have this brokenness, if I didn't have this ugly stuff. Isn't that amazing? Not in spite of, but because of my experiences, I have people in my life who I can't even imagine doing life without. I love these people. There's a couple people actually in Minnesota. Um, one of them is my friend Dawn, and, and I, I'm not sure she's here today, but um, I can't wait to see her. I've never met this woman. I've never met her face to face. I don't even know what she looks like. And I can't even imagine doing my life without her because we talk so often. And she actually heard me share at Fellowship Weekend, I think. And, you know, God brought us together. And I don't know why she connected with me when she did, but it's like her brokenness and my brokenness together came and made a platform for God to appear. And we have this amazing relationship. And I'm grateful for these relationships. My family is back in my life. Um, I'm I'm probably the closest to my dad out of all five kids. And my dad is not sober. Um, however, he's a quirky, funny, um, weird guy. And, um, you know, and I also have a sister who um, loves to be sober but is not able to be. And um, there's a couple people here who have reminded me of her. And um, I just want to say to you guys, especially if you're an alcoholic, um, there, you know, there's a saying, pray for the stranger. You know, uh, there are still people suffering from alcoholism. A lot of them are in my family. So um, if, if you would continue to do what you do, um, I'm kind of counting on you um, to help some of them. And if you have a family member, and I'm sure you do, who's a little bit baffled by some of the things you've done or even what you're doing today, um, I'd be happy to talk to him. No, <laughs> um, but that's how this thing works. You know, I can't save my family. You can't save your family, but maybe we can save each other. And um, I, I'm just grateful for the restoration I have gotten to experience. I've gotten to, you know, be in weddings, go to funerals, support my sister in soccer games, um, show up. And um, just love people. You don't have to be sober to be in my life. It, uh, my family is all over the map. And um, because of Alan, Alanon is my adapter so that I can have people in my life that normally couldn't be in my life. And that's the whole point of it. It's not to, you know, kind of build walls and say, these are my boundaries, stay out. It's more to say, no, this is my brokenness. This is my wholeness. This is how I'm going to infiltrate and, you know, join the mainstream of life. And um, so I'm showing up, you know, it, it may not be what I want it to be. Um, it's a heck of a lot better than it was. And this is just a season and life comes back around. It always does. And so my job is to, sh you know, to give God the glory and to say, um, you know, I'm walking tall because of you and, um, to extend my hand to someone else who might be hurting. There's another saying I like too. you know, um, be nicer than necessary for everyone you meet is fighting some sort of battle. And, um, and I try to remember that because there's a lot of times that people just didn't know the immense pain that I was in because I wasn't able to share in meetings. And, um, so I know there's people here who's probably in immense pain that can't say anything. And I pray for you too. I encourage you to find someone, anyone that you can trust. Um, because we don't need to do this alone. We just don't have to. Um, there's something, I, I think it's actually in the Bible that says a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. And, um, I, I think it's by no mistake that we have the triangle and the three sides and all of that. But for me, the threefold cord is me, you, and God. And, um, with my Al Anon program, um, I'm able to do my life. I have to show up and be willing. I have to have a hopeful attitude. I have to be grateful for what I have. Um, I have to stop fighting what's happened and let go or be dragged and, um, and bring God into the whole thing. And with that, with that combination, I'm not easily broken anymore. I'm really not. And I'm not saying bring it on life, but, um, you already have, remember? Not my turn. Um, <laughs> um, but I am saying I'm going to be okay no matter what. And you've given me that. I think for my very first meeting, that's what I was looking for. Just tell me I'm going to be okay no matter what. And um, so anyways, I thank you so much for listening to me. This has been a great experience, and I hope you'll come talk to me afterwards. Thanks.